it's two pages. I'll give you well, at the moment, all I've got is a very nice picture of Brenda and Jeff. Oh, you're not seeing this, not seeing the screen share. No. Is everyone else seeing it? Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, it's obviously me then. I don't know why. Maybe somebody else can read it. Okay. Can you put a dot? Um, is there any dot there you can press, Iris? Oh, I'm concerned that Iris isn't. Iris, yeah, I'm concerned you're not seeing it though. Are you seeing it now? No. How Do bizarre. <laughs> Do you have to um oh you have to swipe the screen yeah slide across to view the next do you have to swipe your screen well i'm running my finger backwards and forwards across it and up and down but nothing's oh hang on hang on there's a thing at the top that says switch to screen share yeah, yeah there you go right yeah. okay. yeah. Good. Well, right. Done. So, well done so okay off you go right okay um, yeah <clears throat> The people of Israel are called upon to contribute 13 materials, gold, silver and copper, blue, purple and red dyed wool, flax, goat hair, animal skins, wood, olive oil, spices and gems, out of which, God says to Moses, they shall make for me a sanctuary and I shall dwell amidst them. On the summit of Mount Sinai, Moses is given detailed instructions on how to construct this dwelling for God so that it could be readily dismantled, transported and reassembled as the people journeyed in the desert. In the sanctuary's inner chamber, behind an artistically woven curtain, was the ark containing the tablets of testimony engraved with the Ten Commandments. On the ark's cover stood two winged cherubim hammered out of pure gold. In the outer chamber stood the seven-branched menorah and the table upon which the showbread was arranged. The sanctuary's three walls were fitted together from 48 upright wooden boards, each of which was overlaid with gold and held up by a pair of silver foundation sockets. The roof was formed of three layers of coverings. A, tapestries of multicolored wool and linen. B, a covering made of goat hair. C, a covering of ram and takash skins. Across the front of the sanctuary was an embroidered screen held up by five posts. Surrounding the sanctuary and the copper-plated altar which fronted it was an enclosure of linen, hanging, linen hangings supported by 60 wooden posts with silver hooks and trimmings and reinforced by copper stakes. Okay. Thank you very much. What, so what's this week's end of Truma starts... What is a takash Sorry? skin? Tachash is, is an animal, right, the Tachash was an animal, um, different views about what it was. I think one view was it was seal skin, but I may have got that wrong. Let's have a quick look. Good old, there's much discussion about what it was. Uh, let's see. No. Um, so, so, um, it seems it might have been a hyacinth. What's that? Or, uh, yeah, it could have been a hyacinth possibly, or it could have been an animal. What's a hyacinth? Um, which, Flower. Hyacinth, as in the flower. Um, hyacinth. Some say it was possibly hyacinth. Hyacinth, like as in uh, the flower. Hyacinth. Flower. Oh. Yeah. Some say it was some kind of an animal that lived in the wilderness that doesn't exist anymore. Could have been ermine, possibly from the stoat. Uh, the Talmud says it was a unique animal that was only for the for the Mishkan. Uh, some say it was a badger, seal, or a dolphin. So there's all kinds of different suggestions. Some kind well, of animal gonna, skin. Okay. It's so unlikely to be hyacinth. That's why. Because it says skin. Yeah. So I think that was more the color. Well. Sorry. Yes. So there are some views that it was a biblical animal that doesn't exist, or a seal, or a badger, 
or all kinds of things. Google it. It's very interesting. There's a few articles about it. But that's probably why it's translated there as Tachash, because it's open to discussion. Um, yeah. So we've got a lot of information here about the Mishkan. Now, let's just put this into perspective, because it's not just this week, Sedra. It's Tzavah next week, Kitisa the week after, and, and um, Bayakal Pukudai. Next five Sedras, including this week, go into great detail, often repeated, about the Mishkan, the Tabernacle. So there's a few obvious glaring questions. Uh, what were we learning about last week? Last week was Mishpatim. We were learning about laws and about the journey through the desert. Suddenly we we go off at a tangent and we have the rest of the book of uh, Shemot basically deals with the um, tabernacle, right? Now, so a few questions, obvious questions. The first one is why, why now at this point? Any other obvious questions? Uh, wasn't the other, the last week said you're out of order? In what sense? Well, well, it doesn't, you know, it's not necessarily in order. The, the, it, the, the Torah is not exactly written in, it, in every Sedra in order. We are told that, yeah. But last week we're told, followed on from, Mishpatim follows on from the giving of the Torah to teach us that these laws have the same importance as the laws given at Sinai. So that's what Rashi says. So it makes sense to include, I guess, societal laws after the giving of the Torah. The question is, so there's a few questions. One is why we suddenly start talking about the Mishkan now, the tabernacle, in such great detail. Um, it was, after all, only temporary. We know that ultimately the temple is going to be built in Jerusalem. It's a temporary measure. Um, we know that it says, you shall make for me a sanctuary and I shall dwell within you, each and every one of you. So it's only symbolic in a sense. So why so much, um, so many column inches devoted to it? And why now? I suppose Basically, it, it didn't... The Jewish people needed to focus. Right, good. So we needed to focus. Julian, what were you going to say? Only that, it, yes, it was temporary, but it was quite a long temporary because it was the best part of 40 years. Fair point. Okay. What would you say characterizes their attitude until now? If you had to sum up in one word what the children of Israel are best known for, until this point, what would it be? Grumbling. Ingratitude. Right. Complaining. It's, it's sad, isn't it? You know, <laughs> complaining. Right? I would have thought. Yeah, let's read source number one, just to remind us. And this is quite typical of who would like to read. I'll read source. it. Off you go. Number one, yeah. And they said to Moses, was it for want of graves in Egypt that you brought us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, taking us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt, saying, let us be and we will serve the Egyptians, for it is better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? Right, that's just one sampling of complaints, right? Then they, after they cross the sea, they complain, there's no water, the water's bitter, bitter there's no food, there's not enough choice of food, they end up with the quails. Again, no water. That's why Moshe eventually strike, taught, initially strikes the rock the first time. What happens after the giving of the Torah? They complain that Moshe's not back and they build the golden calf. Complain, complain, grumble, moan, complain, complain, complain. That's all they ever do. So what do you do with a group of people that have no, as Beryl said, no focus, no purpose? All they're doing is moaning and groaning. What you do you do with them? Give them something to do. You give them something to do to get their minds off it. Right. You're a teacher. You give them a project. Right? You say, OK, you guys are going to build a treehouse or you're going to build a bridge across this, uh, this river. We're going to give you a nice project to do, a team building, bonding exercise. And guess what? As far as I know, in the next few centuries, there's no complaints. In fact, the only complaint is the most magnificent one of all, which is Moshe, when he has to tell the people they've brought too much. Yeah, if you recall, it's the only fundraising campaign in history where he says we've raised too much. And Moshe says to them, stop bringing your gifts right, this week, Cedra. So you have a bunch of people who are not really getting it. They're just complaining the whole time. Everything's happening for them. It's all miraculous. Everything's happening on a plate. We know the classic explanation that why the, the spies were not evil. One of the reasons given that the spies came back with their reports was they knew that once the people enter the land of Israel and they have to work the land and work for themselves and roll up their sleeves, then their whole attitude is going to change. So God says, like any good teacher or team leader or parent, uh, we'll give you a shared project. We'll give you a project. What's the project? 
build the Mishkan, and there's no complaints. Everyone contributes. Some bring silver, some bring gold, some bring bronze, some bring animal skins, some give their skills. Right? So much so, as we said, that Moshe had to tell them to stop. Complete change of focus. And it works because they stop complaining. Give them something to do. Give them a shared goal. Give them a project to work on. And they stop complaining. They stop arguing. And they all pull together. What is the famous quote? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Who actually said that? Churchill? No, Kennedy. Kennedy. Kennedy, yeah. Didn't do him much good. Got shot. Oh, temporarily. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a instead of asking what does God do for us, what can we do for God? We and it's also the idea of the Mishkan, it's transformative that you transform the mundane. So maybe that's the clue, or maybe that's the point. <laughs> that, that it's great wandering through the wilderness, seeing miracle after miracle, splitting the sea, you know, the thunder and lightning, the revelation at Sinai. But in a way, they were bystanders. Everyone knows that you want people to be participants. You want them to feel, as they say, to buy into something. This is the first time they're really having to roll up the sleeves and do something. And it works. They stop complaining and they get on with it. So there's an idea in this. And this is the idea which we talk about a lot in different places. The Talmud talks about it in two places, which we'll look at here. Source number two which is about judges who would like to be source number two. I'll read that, Rabbi. Go for it. The judge who judges a true judgment truthfully, even if it sits in judgment only one hour, the verse ascribes to him as if he became a partner to the Holy One, blessed be he, in the act of creation, as by means of a true judgment, he upholds the world. So here's one way. How do you become a partner with God? By exercising justice. We know justice is a supreme value. It's interesting. Um, I was just talking to someone earlier, um, Rabbi Sachs, um, um, not to denigrate him in any way, but uh, I remember years ago, my security officer at the time, uh, not initial, I hasten to add, came back from the CST dinner and said, oh, Rabbi Sachs spoke so well. And he said that, we're, the biggest mitzvah is not to be in shul, but to stand outside shul and do security. It's the biggest mitzvah you can do. So he felt very vindicated that he never used to go into shul. So I, I said to him, perhaps a little bit tongue in cheek, I said, I don't, don't take this the wrong way. I said, but I'm sure Rabbi Sachs, whatever group he's speaking to, you know, wants to build them up. And I'm sure when he speaks to doctors and nurses, he says, that's the biggest mitzvah. When he speaks to rabbis, he says, being a rabbi is that, anyway. But, um, um, interestingly, the person who Rabbi Sachs is supposed to have described as closest to God. Anyone know who it was? Anyone know this? I'll give you a clue. It's another Lord. Winston. Thank you, Lord Winston. So I heard Rabbi Sachs once say that Lord Winston was the closest person to God. Why? Because Lord Winston is a fertility expert. And by helping people to achieve the miracle of childbirth, that we know that the ultimate act of creation is the creation of a child. And we know from the sources that it's not just the father and mother, the third partner in creation is the almighty. So um, I, I personally heard Rabbi Sachs say that at least once. It's a, it's a beautiful idea. So that's one way you become a partner in the act of creation is reproduction. But there are other ways as well. And the Talmud gives us another one as well, which is very accessible to many of us who would like to be number three. Volunteers? I can read yep. it. Oh, read it. Go, go on, Lisa. Lisa. Oh, no. sorry, it vanished. Go for it. Okay, Rabbi said, and some people say it was Rabbi Yeshua Ben Levi who said, even individual who prays on Shabbat evening must recite the passage and heavens and the earth will finish by that's why that, that's why Yechulu from from the beginning of Kiddush, right? Which we also say in Friday night davening. As we say at the beginning of Kiddush, the quote from the beginning of uh, the uh, the account of creation. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. Genesis two one to three, as Haman Hamnuna. Hamnuna, yeah. Anyone who prays on Shabbat evening and recites the path of Bakuhu, 
Baker Hulu, the verse ascribed him credit as if he became a partner with Holy One, with the Holy One. Blessed be He in the act of creation. And it is stated, and the heavens and the earth were finished. Baker Hulu, do not read it as were finished Fakihulu rather as they finished Fakihulu. Let, thank you. So let me just clarify that. Um, on Friday night we say Vaikhulu Hashman Boretz, the heavens and the earth were finished. The word Vaikhulu means Vaikhal means to finish. Vaikhulu seems to be plural. So the assumption is that it means the heavens and the earth, plural, were finished being created. So the Talmud says don't read it as they were finished, but rather we finished creating in the plural. So when you acknowledge God as creator of heavens and earth, when you say Vaichol on Shabbat evening and you basically bear testimony to the creation of heaven and earth, you become a partner in creation. It was just another example. So there's other places that Talmud speaks about becoming a partner in creation. So, you know, when you're fundraising, or people often say you, you talk about people as being your partners. People want to be partners. People don't want to be your underlings. They want to be equal. They want to be your peers. They want to be your partners. You know, God says you're a partner in creation with me. When you build the Mishkan, you engage, you become a partner with God. And when you give... Sorry? Oh, sorry, sorry, it's my brain's also. Oh, hello. When you give people a job to do, it focuses them, as Beryl said earlier. And finally, let's see a classic one, which we probably all also know. Uh, who would like to read? Julian, would you like to read? Okay. Rabbi Alaza said that Rabbi Hadina said, Torah scholars increase peace in the world, as is this said. And all your children, Benayich, shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. If all the children of Israel are taught of the Lord, there will be peace for all. The sages interpreted this verse homiletically. Do not read your children, Benayich, but your builders, Bonayich. Torah scholars are those who build peace for their generation. As it is stated, those who love your Torah have great peace. There is no stumbling block for them that's um that that comes up towards the end of the Shabbos Muslim Correct. service doesn't it? yes so yes if you look at let me, let me sit out a minute uh where is it gone Here. just before um yes Laman I just want Laman correct after Angela Kano so after Angela. just before Elena um I'm not sure if it's in the singers let me just check it is, is it? I think it is it is in the singers yeah oh it is yes what ton of the is not in the singers right so Amar Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Elam, as I said in the name of Rabbi Chanina, Talmidei Chachamim, Mavin Shalom Ba'olam. The people was laugh, right? It says the sages increase peace in the world, as it says, "Chol Banayich Lam Lemudei Hashem, Rav Shalom Banayich." All of your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. And then the Talmud says, "Don't read it as Banayich, a Ben is a child, Banayich, but Bonayich, Bonet is to build, right? So it's a, it's a play on words, it's a pun." So Banayich means your children, your sons, but it also means your builders. Why? Because it says that uh, when you learn Torah, you're basically building for the next generation. Again, it's this idea of being a builder, of being a partner. Right? It's a very strong idea that we find throughout. So we have an interesting problem. So on the one hand, we said it's all very nice having all miracles happen and miraculous events and revelations, um, it can backfire because people, whoops, sorry, people become so dependent on it that they don't, they don't work for themselves. There's no sense. But then, you know, that's great that God gives you everything on a plate. But the downside is you're not working for yourself. And because you're not working for yourself, you don't feel, I'm sure I've told you before about my friend who got a Fiat Panda. I remember um, I went to Carmel College, a bunch of very, very, very wealthy Jewish kids there. Their first car was a BMW or something like that. I had a friend whose first car was a Fiat Panda. It was 20 years old at the time. He spent 500 pounds on it. He scrimped and saved for a whole summer. I think he worked in a bar somewhere. I don't remember what he did. Um, and he used to lovingly polish his car. You know, every Sunday you saw the love and affection he had for his car because he had worked for it. So sometimes when you don't work for something, you don't really appreciate it. So that's on the one hand. So along comes God and says, you know what? You're all arguing and complaining the whole time. You're basically spoiled brats. I'm going to give you a project to do, something to build. You will become my partner. And in the process, you'll become builders and you will buy into this whole vision. Suddenly you become partners. You're not, you're, 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 but you're, um, you're up, you're not bystanders anymore. Now there can be a downside to that. What's the downside to that? Is the other, sorry. Oh, it's the kids again. The downside is, of course, you can hit the other extreme. Person says, well, 
you know, it's all about me. It's not about God. There's no God in things. You know, I make my own luck. I work on Shabbat because I have to. Otherwise, I won't make a living or whatever. And the Torah, of course, warns us famously about this. Here's the famous warning from Devarim 8. And I want to read that. Who would like to read? Who hasn't read yet? If you like. Please, go for it. Say to yourselves, my own power and the might of my own hand have won this wealth for me. Echayel doesn't just mean wealth. It means strength. So this is in, um, it says that there could come a time when you're successful and you say to yourselves, you bite the hand that feeds you. You say, this is a very famous quote. This quote we've come across before, if you may recall, is the basis of probably a lot of theological debate or argument in the modern state of Israel. It's the basis of often cited on all sides regarding, let's say, the role of military service of the IDF, the, the religious um, community, including the religious Zionist community, will say to the secular community, you know, you say it's all about, you know, making sure we have the best army, but what about our spiritual protection? And the problem is that you say to yourself, it's my own doing, it's my power, it's my might which have achieved this strength for me. No, it's God's might and power. Then along comes the, the if you like, the opposite extreme of the Haredi community that says some portions of which say we don't need to go to the military because we're in yeshiva. And by the way, I don't think people in yeshiva necessarily think you don't need an army. They think that because they're studying, they shouldn't go to fight. There may be those who believe the whole premise is wrong. And then you'll have a religious soldier who puts on tefillin every morning and davens and learns during the break who says uh, we need the best fighting force in the world, but we also need to recognize where our true strength comes from. And that is what Judaism wants from us. Judaism doesn't want us to sit back and wait for miracles to happen like in the desert. Because then we've got no focus. We just start moaning and grumbling and kvetching. The other those who help themselves. Right. The other extreme is that you shouldn't think that it's all down to you. So the answer is, like everything, is the middle path. The middle path is a person says, I need to do what we call our hishtadlus. I need to make an effort. Right? I want to find a shidduch. I need to go out and do it. I, need, I want to earn a living. I have to find a job. I have to go for interviews. I have to whatever. I have to train. Um, if I want to succeed, I have to put some effort in. But at the same time, I recognize uh, if, I, if I want to defend my country, I need an army. But at the same time, I need to recognize that ultimate success comes from God, oh. who's in the background. Right? If I'm ill, I need to go to a doctor and pray to God that he will allow the doctor to do his thing. Pray to God that he will allow the IDF to successfully defend our country. Pray to God that the vaccines will work, you know, but uh, you know, do both. Um, okay, actually, you don't have to go as far as Israel. All some of the discussion going on in <coughs> Jewish communities right now about COVID reflects this as well. I would say a healthy balance would be somebody who is saying extra prayers, of course, because we're living in very difficult times. At the same time, is take every precaution they can, including vaccination. Um, you have people who will say, well, prayers don't help you now. It's all down to the science. And then you have people saying science doesn't help you. It's all down to prayers. Neither approach is correct. So the Torah warns us against this. Don't think it's down to you. It's not your power. It's not your hand. That's why we say brochas. That's why we thank God for things before we eat and before we do things. Because we recognize his providence. But as Iris said, God helps those who help themselves, provided it's within the framework of what the Torah mandates. So I read a very interesting article recently about something called orthonomics, which is basically how economics works or doesn't work in the orthodox community, that it doesn't add up basically having large families or marrying off your kids, I don't know, whatever people need to spend money on. Some people go on trips for Pesach every year to hotels. It doesn't add up. And it's basically a miracle that anyone can survive. And then there was an interesting back and forth with different discussion about whether you should rely on miracles. And some people say yes, and some people say no. And anyway, I was very tempted. It was in Mishpacha magazine. I was very tempted to write a letter something that's troubled me for a long time, which is, um, and I've discussed it with people I know that are in Kolal and Israel and things like that, that in many communities, and I can't say all communities, but there are many communities where there is a tolerance of low-level, um, should we say, benefit fraud or tax fraud. It's just expected. Okay. There was a case, I don't know if anyone saw, there was a case in court in Stamford Hill recently. Jeff may have seen it, um, Jeff Saltman, very probably relevant to your work, where... Um, a couple of got divorced and they were dividing up the assets and the complication was that the house was in the brother's name. It was in the brother's name in order to avoid losing the housing benefit or something like that. And this came out in court and, you know, it then yeah. came out that this was happening quite a lot, things like that. So let's not get into the rights and wrongs of all these things. The question is, what is the mindset of a person who says to themselves, the only way I can survive is 
by being dishonest in my dealings, mm. whether it's my dealings with the HMRC or my dealings with others or my dealings, whatever, with social, with the benefits office. This is the only way I can survive. How is that any different from the person who says, I have to work on Shabbos, otherwise I won't make enough money to live. And to such a person, the religious community say, you're wrong. You don't have to work on Shabbos because Rosh Hashanah, God decided how much money you're going to have already. And working on Shabbos isn't going to help you. In fact, it's going to harm you. It's the same, surely it's the same point. That the reason for being honest is because, besides being the right thing to do, the reason for being honest is because Hashem is going to give you what you deserve, regardless of you shouldn't have to break the rules in order to get it. In the same way that it's wrong to say, I have to work on Shabbos, otherwise I won't make a living. Surely it's wrong to say, I have to defraud the revenue. Otherwise, forget all the Chil Hashem, all the other things. It, there's a flaw in the, in, the, in the thinking behind it and a lack of trust in God. So I brought this up with a number of friends of mine. And they also basically, you're right. And the only explanation anyone can come up with is that many communities, particularly the more kind of Hasidic communities, have their origins in places like Russia and Hungary, where at the time you basically, you had to be dishonest. It was the only way to survive, but that's not the case anymore. So it's an interesting debate, but it's all the same point. Person says, if I don't, you know, put my house in my brother's name so that I can claim housing benefit, then I won't survive. Wait a minute, who's providing your bonus? Is it God or is it you? If it's God, he'll find a way. If it's you, you're right. Then you better work on Shabbos and Yom Tov as well. So Juden says, no, you have to find the balance. You have to recognize, you have to do everything you can to protect yourself to save lives to be healthy to be wealthy to be well um it's good to you know have a career and a profession and so on but please recognize that true blessing comes from god but at the same time you need to roll up your sleeves and that's what the mishkan teaches us until then they didn't have to roll up their sleeves now they have to roll up their sleeves and we see it was, it was actually very good for them it was good for their um development as a nation and their maturity so what happened in the desert, even up till the giving of the Torah, maybe up till the Pasha that we read this week, is an exceptional situation. It's not the norm. The norm is not that, you know, food falls from the sky and you have a well of water that gives you water whenever you need and your clothes never need washing. And, you know, you, you have a cloud, a pillar of fire. And that's not normal life. It's a very special kind of chapter in history, but it's limited. Mm. Uh, God says, no, this is not the reality. The reality is something else. Mm. I'll give you the reality. You need to be builders. You need to be part of things. You need to have buy-in. It's very interesting. And this project seems to have gone very well, actually. Now, interestingly, because it's not a given, can you think of a building project that went wrong? Tower Babel. Oh. Right. Sometimes you give people a focus, it can backfire. They can all turn on you, <laughs> like the Tower of Babel. So it can backfire. I don't know if any of the commentaries say it, but maybe this is the redemption of the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, they all came together to challenge God. Here they come together to serve God. Um, and then you have the other challenge, which is always the challenge of leadership. The challenge every parent goes through is how to let go, how to empower the people that you're leading to do things for themselves. Till now, Moshe was doing everything. But we saw also the issue where he says to Moshe, you can't do it all yourself. You need to devolve power. And they built a structure of courts. But there's another issue. It's not healthy when you do it all yourself. Because when you do it all yourself, when it's motion down the mountain the whole time to commune with God, that's all very nice. But how does the ordinary person feel involved? When it's fireworks and, you know, uh, what do you call it? Smoke and, and fire and brimstone and all that going on. It's very impressive. But when the show is over, what's your connection? So the answer is God says, right, now you're going to build a tabernacle for me. You're all going to have buy into this. Right? We see it in other ways as well. The half shekel that they brought. Everybody was a partner. Uh, the first community charge on poll tax without the riots. We see, it, we know nowadays, you know, I'm not very good about this, but they say when they teach you how to speak in public now, they say that in a given class, it should be 50% the presenter and 50% the audience because people don't want to hear someone else talk. You know, I'm from the older generation, I talk too much, but it's, it's a big thing now. Um, so all of this we see starting to happen with the building of Mishkan. So it's not just the Mishkan, it's what it represents. Um, right, and it's always more satisfying when you've had a hand in it, you've done it, it was your project. Like I said, you know, a successful fundraiser won't say to someone, will you give us some money for our project? Say, will you become a partner in our project? Would you like to become a stakeholder, a partner, a pillar of this project? That's far more, I don't, I don't know, I mean, I'm not, I imagine that's far more enticing to be a partner in something big than to just be a sort of 
casual bystander. Oh, I'll give you some money for your cause. No, we're making you a partner. And if you look, a lot of the successful fundraising drives, that's the, the phrasing they seem to use. You become our partner. You, know, you become a builder. You become a, a part of this process. So, so I, I, when I do tours of the shawl, I always, for non-Jewish schools, I used to always show them, explain them about the Safer Torah. In Cardiff, they had a beautiful thick plaque on the wall, which had the, was like a scroll with the names of the people who had given to the last, so, you know, we have an interesting situation. It's a wonderful project to write a Safer Torah for a community. It brings people together. It, as you said, it gives everyone buy-in. It's not my Safer Torah that I got written, or as lovely as it is that Harry Cohen gave a Safer Torah, it's beautiful. But it's an amazing thing when everyone's bought a, a word, a letter. It's our collective Safer Torah. The problem we have in our shores, we have too many of them. We don't need any more. It's often a, when a community needs unity, they'll often write a Safer Torah. Or when there's been a bereavement and you write Safer Torah in memory of someone and Everyone in the family chips in. It's a very special thing. You're right. Because people buy into it. It's not the Cohen family say for Torah, the Levy family say for Torah. It's everybody's. We all have a part in it. We all have a letter in it or a word. It's a beautiful thing. It's very special. You're right. And it's more meaningful. It's very meaningful to people. You had a hand in this. You were part of this. Your donation helped. It's a very special thing. So we see that. But you need to empower people. To do things basically. Um, this is society. It's interesting. Last week, Mishpatim was talking about laws of society, like not stealing and being honest, and you know, uh, property laws and uh, um, employment laws and things. And we move on to actually galvanizing people to give something back to society through the building of the Mishkan. <laughs> we have to be careful. You know, it's happening now. We expect the government to do everything for us to figure everything out. A lot of people. You know, we've become very dependent on that. It's interesting. Also, within the Jewish community, we've become dependent on central guidance from the United Synagogue or the Chief Rabbi, because that's the nature of the times we're living in, is we need people that understand the issues. But actually, it's in many ways, it's more powerful when you have local devolved power. What is right for your community? What is right for your organization? Not just relying on, you know, one of the, one of the complaints now is central government is is, is, is di dictating everything to us. But uh, this is one of the issues, if you remember, with Manchester, when they're saying, well, you know, you're telling us what to do, but we have very different issues up north from down south. Centralized things don't work so well. Sometimes you have to do it. Um, and the state doing things versus society. That's interesting. If you look at the charity sector, of course, there are many charities that do things that the state probably should be doing, but the charities that do it, whether it's looking after the homeless or Jewish care, providing social service facilities, or mental health support. On the one hand, you could say that's a failing of society, uh, of the state rather. On the other hand, it's probably a better model when you have local community charities or organizations and providers that know that are, you know, more people who, who wants to give a, you know, when you get your tax bill, you don't say, I'm going to give extra to support mental health services. You know, it's uh, somebody, uh, I was listening to something, somebody said, you know, we've solved the problem of NHS funding, you know, get, get 100 year olds to run around the garden, it's more effective than government funding. Um, and a shout out, by the way, to Captain Moore, very sad that he passed away, I actually tried to get hold of him to interview him for my podcast, but by the time I tried to get hold of him, he was very famous and very hard to get hold of. Amazing man, look what he achieved. You know, that's not central government, that's one guy in his garden. So there's a lot to be said for the power of community and society, not central government, not the state. Um, well, we looked after a... our own when, when, when the immigrants, us, when we immigrated to here, there was no welfare from the government. People had right. soup kitchens and helped societies to build right. the guardians and places right. like that. Right. And that's we, our community has always been lauded by the non Jewish community for how we look after ourselves, how we create institutions. The big society, was it David Cameron's thing? You know, that's, well, Judaism already has such a concept. Uh, and in a way, a small state, but big society, meaning community and charitable organizations and communal organizations and structures. Um, thank you to Lord Sachs for quoting things that I've never heard of. So um, if anyone has heard of a chap called Alexis de Tocqueville, anyway, he wrote about American democracy in the 1930s, uh, sorry, 1830s. Interesting stuff. Who would like to read some uh, com social commentary from the 1830s? Who hasn't read yet? I haven't. Pam, Pam, you can be an 1830s social commentator. <laughs> um, 
Above this race of men stands an immense and tutelary. tutelary power, which takes upon itself alone to secure the gratif their gratifications and to watch over their fate. That power is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It would be like the authority of a parent if, like that authority, its object was to prepare men for manhood, but it seeks, on the contrary, to keep them in perpetual childhood. It is well content that the people should rejoice, provided they think of nothing but rejoicing. For their happiness, such a government willingly labours, but it chooses to be the sole agent and the only arbiter of that happiness. It provides for their security, foresees and supplies their necessities, facilitates their pleasures, manages their principal concerns, directs their industry, regulates the descent of property, and subdivides their inheritance. What remains but to spare them all the care of thinking and all, and all the trouble of living? Interesting words. So the nanny state, basically. Ooh. And as it says, it's not like a parent trying to prepare a child for maturity. It's perpetual nannying. Um, we, we, we thought we'd moved away from a nanny state, but of course, whoops, what's happened with COVID is we've very much gone back to that. Uh, the state tells us everything. Now, we probably can't help that because of the necessities of public health. There are some people who say, give people the information, let them make their own decisions. The problem is people make stupid decisions. So all this is written 200 years ago. It's very topical. The other thing, of course, that strikes me is the whole Brexit business. Uh, what we're seeing now, I don't fully understand the whole vaccine thing, but it seems pretty clear to me that had we not left Europe, we probably wouldn't be vaccinating as effectively as we are right now. It is our release from the EU, which has allowed us to basically get on with it. Are they still wrangling over red tape? And it's the one thing we've we've majorly got right. So central central authority says uh, Mr. Tocqueville, not not good. The terror also. It's when you have central authority, even if it's God Himself. What leads to the golden calf? That the people are used to having this man Moshe, who's everything to them. He's their you know he's their connection to God. And when he's gone for an extra day, they panic and they they freak out. That should, surely that shouldn't be the case. Surely. You know, when we lost Rabbi Sachs, it was tragic, but the world didn't end. You know, people find ways to carry on. You you live with a person's teachings. Moshe was gone for one extra day and everything fell apart. Maybe that's because the society was too centered on, on the central power. So what happens now? God says, OK, I'm going to make you partners. You're going to be builders. You're going to play a part in this. It's not going to be just sit back and let us make all the decisions for you. And that seems very apt with what's going on in the world today. And perhaps one of the problems with COVID and compliance is that it's all central diktats. I don't know how you get more buy-in. I know there's a few things going on. So, like, it's interesting. I'm on a, a – I mean, I do visit hospitals. I do go to the cemeteries a lot. I consider myself, in that sense, to be in risky environments, and I had no problem taking a vaccine. I was lucky to get one. But I do have colleagues who feel guilty about being offered a vaccine. They say, well, I'm, you know, I'm under 70, and I'm perfectly well, and give it to someone who needs it. I say, so interestingly, one point was made, and I think Rabbi Shochet said that when he went for the vaccine, what they actually said was, you know, get your picture taken and put it on social media, because having faith leaders getting vaccinated will hopefully inspire others to do it. So not only should you take it, but actually by doing so, you can inspire others to, which is an interesting angle as well. Um, there's some of that is starting to happen now. Hackney's had a big drive. Um, they showed certain Ramon in getting vaccines to try to encourage their followers to do it. So actually, it's the same idea in a way. You need buying. You need to. You need to enable, empower people. You can't just do everything centrally. That's perhaps one of the problems. Perhaps one of the issues with particular communities that are not following guidelines is that it's just too centralized from the, from top down rather than bottom up. Doesn't work. You need a bottom up approach. Very difficult to do it in reality because things are changing day to day and. Something has to come from the center, but it's, you know, if we had our time again, if we're planning for another pandemic, God forbid, in the future, maybe one of the comments is, how do you get more, how do you, instead of announcing 10,000 pound fines and 10 year prison sentences for people, which just gets people wound up, how do you get people to buy into it themselves? It's difficult, a lot of people are very stupid, but these are good questions. They're not new questions. 
And the Mishkan is symbolic of all of this. Give them something to do. Give them a focus. Give them a way to bond. Let them buy into the whole vision. So it's not just God doing everything for them, but it's coming. And ultimately, of course, that was the purpose of the Mishkan. It says, Mikdash, you shall make for me a sanctuary. I will then dwell within them. I don't think God speaks of dwelling amongst us before that. Uh, and those of you who follow the annual discussions about the giving of the Torah and the Kabbalistic significance, according to the Hasidic and Kabbalistic teachings, we will say that until the Torah was given, we didn't have the same power to, to join heaven and earth. After the Torah is given, we know God says, I will descend from, uh, and, uh, and Moshe goes up. So that barrier between heaven and earth is broken. And the idea that you can now bring heaven down to earth, how through mitzvahs you tap into spirituality. Again, it's empowering us. We're not bystanders. We become active participants. And that's the key to success. Rabbi, so in the words, there, could I just ask, isn't there a, a shlach, a rock, a rock, isn't there a saying that kind of everything is ordained by Hashem and yeah. the prophecy that we don't have the powers? It's kind of divinely. Right. And yet we know that we have to do our what's called his tablets. We have to put in our effort. We are given a set of. So in Judaism, we don't say if a person gets. There are religions. I don't know about now. Christianity for many years had a belief in certain. It was quite widespread that if you got sick, it was because of sin. And, you know, you needed to atone for your sin rather than going to a doctor. And there were stories of people that didn't go to the doctor. In Judaism, we've always valued doctors. You go to the doctor, you know, by all means, do your spiritual efforts, but go to the doctor. You know, you, you have a leak, you know, it's not God punishing you. Well, it might be, but get the plumber to come and fix it. You know, uh, there's a pandemic going on. Wear a mask when you go out, if that's the advice, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is always the, 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 uh, can't think of the words not paradox, maybe dichotomy of Judaism. Uh, you, you, it's, it's the kind of the, maybe the paradox, yes, of Judaism is on the one hand, and like we said earlier, don't work on Shabbos because you're not supposed to, but you do need to go out and earn a living. Don't expect money to grow on trees unless you're the chancer. Don't expect it to fall out the sky. You need to go out and earn a living, but at the same time, you need to do so knowing that Hashem blesses you with your power and our son. Therefore, work on Shabbos is not going to help you. You need to look after your health, but also know that it comes from Hashem. And some people live till 120 despite drinking and smoking all day. And some people drop dead at 45, even though they're in good health. And there's no rhyme or reason to these things, you know. And, you know, oh, <laughs> if... Uh, it's the old joke, you know, guys having to win the lottery. And Hashem says, I'm trying to help you, but you have to buy a ticket. Right? So that's it. You, you have to do your bit. You're right. Ultimately, it's all preordained. We're told everything's Hashem about this. But it doesn't excuse us from making the efforts through the natural laws and natural channels available. And by the way, I think there are people who genuinely have reached a point. Um, I went to Leighton's Thunder School a couple of weeks ago, Shabbos, to make up the mini and whatever with the boys, and it was very nice, and everyone was keeping the rules. A bunch of guys from Stanford Hill there, including the traveling Hasidim. And yes, they were all wearing masks, and they were all social distancing. One of the guys said to me, we cannot imagine life without a minion. For us, it's our life. It's our, you know, it's uh, uh, COVID or no COVID. So, I mean, at the moment, minion are illegal. But, you know, you could say on the one hand, well, yes, but, you know, <laughs> if a minion is dangerous, you don't go to a minion. But, there are people who feel that this is something you have to do and I'll take that risk, you know, in the same way that most people are prepared to, prepared to take a risk to go shopping. If you can't get your shopping online, you know, why are you allowed to go shopping? Because people say, I have to have food. So people take these risks and you ask them, how do you take that risk? They'll say, look, it's in Hashem's hands. What do you mean it's in Hashem's hands? Well, you don't look both ways before you cross the road. Of course you do. So everyone sets their level of, I guess, bitachon. some people have complete trust in God and they do very silly things. And other people have complete trust in God, but they are extremely careful. And then you have everything in between. And I think that perhaps that probably gives us a bit more of a clue and clarity into, you know, how can people make, uh, make weddings during lockdown, all this kind of thing, you know, leaving aside strong emotional feelings about it. The thinking is it's a mitzvah to get married. And, you know, God is in charge and he will protect us. Right? The problem with that is you have to also protect yourself. So it's that balance. Jeff, you're right. If At the end of the day, <laughs> I knew somebody who said, you know, they didn't, they want, didn't want to go to Israel because it's too dangerous, right? When did they say that? September the 10th, 2000 and uh, when was it? When was 2001, right? The next day, the Twin Towers blew up. So, you know, or they used to say for bullets got your name on it, right? So, you know, it's, you're right. But, but Judaism says you have to take care of yourself. God helps those who help themselves within the framework of terror. Um, let's see the wonderful Lord Tax on all of this.
There we go. Quote from Lord Tax. It's not what God does for us, but what we do for God that allows us to reach dignity and responsibility. I will take that one step further. There's a worldview that says Hashem owes me, right? Blessings and all these things. And a person gets upset if they don't get what they want. And then the other point of view is, what can I do for God? When I daven, I'm not davening because God needs my davening. I'm doing it because it empowers me and it helps me become a better person. When I do a mitzvah, when I build a mishkan, yes, it's something that obviously I benefit from what God's doing for me, but actually it's me giving it forward, basically. And that's really the key to society is when we give, which is truma, when we give unconditionally. And by the way, truma, you may well know that at the beginning of the parsha it says, the nosanu, they shall give, and it's a palindrome. When you give to others, you give back to yourself as well. So it's not one-sided. But we see that in, in this, the whole shift of the Torah to start talking about the Mishkan. Why? Because it's about us giving, it's about us doing something for Hashem, and that in turn creates the dwelling place for him. It's a complete shift in thinking. Till now, God did everything through Moshe, through himself, through miracles and signs and wonders, and suddenly now, we become the architects of our own destiny. And it, it works. They stop complaining. It works. Give people a project. Give them something to do. Every teacher knows it. Empower them. You know, one of the greatest challenges of online learning, the kids said, is no matter how good the teacher is, ultimately, a lot of it is just watching it you, it's very hard to participate it's very hard to involve people in the same way you would in a classroom that's the problem people like to be involved they like to be partners there we go so it's a very interesting idea and i think it's very relevant to many aspects of society today that when we look at it as us building and being a part of things and stakeholders rather than bystanders it's a very different view and i don't have the answer to it but i think you know if, if society is always the government was more successful in getting people to buy into their vision and feel like they are stakeholders, then maybe people would be more willing to sacrifice and all the rest of it. Anyway, there we go. Any questions? The uptake of the vaccine.